sun exists. Do you see the sun right now? Wikipedia. Wikipedia. <laughs> there you go. Well, we believe in object permanence, so we believe the sun is still there even when we can't see it, right? What about gravity? How do we know gravity exists? Have you ever seen gravity? No, but we've seen its effects, right? How do you know Homer existed? Have you ever met Homer, the poet? Do you have a photograph of him? There were no cameras in his time, but we have his writings, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and others refer to Homer, so that's how we know Homer exists. Or what about the aardvark? Have you ever seen an aardvark? How do you know this photograph is really what an aardvark looks like? Or the Mariana Trench? How do you know that that's really there? I mean, there are all kinds of things that we believe in and that we just know, sort of factually, that exist that we haven't ever actually seen ourselves, right? And how do we figure out that something exists? Well, personal experience, the testimony of others, logic, scientific experiments. There are a lot of different reasons, but one reason that I would say is that is a, a very bad reason is circular reasoning. So if you start with the question, how do you know the Bible is true, and you answer it by saying, God wrote it, the next question immediately comes forward is, how do you know God wrote it? And then if you answer, the Bible says God wrote it, we have returned to where we started. How do you know the Bible is true? This is the worst form of argumentation. It just goes in a circle. It doesn't actually prove anything. And I think we can do a lot better in the question of God's existence. And so what I like to do with you tonight is look at six reasons for God's existence apart from the Bible. We're going to look at the Bible later in this class, why Christianity, but we, I want to show you six reasons. And when you live in a society where everyone already believes in God, you don't, you don't need lots of reasons for God's existence, do you? But we live in a time where God's belief in God and faith in general is contested. And so I believe that you need to be equipped to be able to give good reasons and answers to people when they ask the God question or when they ask you, why do you believe in any of that stuff anyhow? And so that's what I hope to be able to do with you. I want to look at these six reasons, the beginning of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe for life, DNA code, moral absolutes, miracles, and personal experience. And I am going to fit this all into less than uh, 30 minutes left that I have, and uh, so it's going to be about five minutes each. Some of these I have a little bit more on than others. I'm just going to give a brief overview on these subjects. I could easily do an hour on each one or more, um, but I just want to show you the, the, the basic case and the understanding behind it. So the first one is the beginning of the universe, also known as the Kalam cosmological argument. How do you know that God exists based on the beginning of the universe. It goes something like this. Number one, everything that has a beginning has a cause of its beginning. Premise number two, the universe has a beginning. Conclusion, therefore, the universe has an external cause of its beginning. And I say it's external because the universe didn't exist at the moment it began. Just like an apple didn't exist at the moment it began, or anything, right? So everything that has a beginning has a cause of its beginning. The universe has a beginning, therefore the universe needs a beginner. And that cause, whatever caused the universe, must be uncaused itself, and eternal, immaterial, capable of ex existing without time, and immensely powerful. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to bring the universe into existence. And we have this Latin saying, I don't know if you've ever encountered it before, but ex nihilo nihil fit, which translates, out of nothing, nothing comes. Think about that for a second. We don't believe in the, in the, in the sort of universe where things just pop into existence out of nowhere, do we? We believe that they, they, there's got to be some source for something to, to come into existence. It doesn't just come on its own. So... Is there something now? Yes, there, something exists now, right? We might be able to disagree on how we describe that, but you exist, I exist, this podium exists, right? Something exists now. Therefore, as, as a result of that, 
there must have always been something in existence. Because if there was at any time absolutely nothing, there could only be nothing now. Right? This, this is a basic principle of logic. Now, we do know that the universe had a beginning. And so the universe must have an origin. It must have come from somewhere. So you need something other than the universe to exist, capable of bringing the universe into existence. What would that be? I mean, that leads directly to God. I, mem I remember sitting across the table in a restaurant with an atheist friend who says to me, I just can't find a way out of the cosmological argument for God's existence, this idea of the universe needing a beginning. And, and, and I said, my friend, you're not an atheist. And he said to me, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't happy about it, but he just recognized the power of the logic that you really did need a beginning. Let's say you're out in the woods. This is an example William Lane Craig uses. Let's say you're out in the woods and suddenly you hear a loud bang. And you turn to the person next to you and you say, what made that bang? And the person said, nothing, nothing. Nothing made that bang. Who would accept that answer? And so William Lane Craig asked the question, what's true of the little bang is true of the big bang. You know, it's interesting, it's interesting because the guy uh, who, who coined the term big bang was, uh, was, was, was coining that term to make fun of the idea because he knew it led to the belief in God's existence. If there was a definitive beginning to the universe, and so it was actually an atheist that, that coined the phrase big bang in order to make fun of the idea. Um, and then they un ended up all believing in it. Um, let's look at number two here, fine-tuning for life, fine-tuning for life. The universe has initial conditions for how everything eventually turned out to be the way that it is. There are dozens of constants that are supplied as the initial conditions of the universe. So I'll give you some examples. There's the gravitational force. I have an equation here for gravity. This is the basic gravitational equation. That big G in the equation is the gravitational constant. It doesn't change no matter what bodies we're talking about. If we want to know how much force due to gravity you experience on Earth here, we put you in for M1 here, okay, your mass, and then we put the Earth's mass in for M2, and then however far you are from the center of the Earth is R, and we square that number and we calculate it out. That's the force you feel due to gravity. And this, this equation works anywhere in the universe. You know, between any two bodies, whether they're the same size or one's big and one's small. Um, and no matter what kind of body we're measuring, G is always the same. It's, that's why we call it a constant. And the question is, why is G this particular number? And uh, the answer is, there is no reason why. There's no law of physics that's forcing G to be this number or any, any number of other constants. Like, for example, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, the strong force, the cosmological constant, the proportion of electrons and protons, masses, to the mass of a neutron in the atom itself. All of these numbers are just sort of set at a certain value. And they could have been otherwise. And if they were otherwise, by even just a small bit, Life could not exist. Complex life could not exist. Intelligent life could not exist. For example, this, this letter G here. If it's, it, if it's off by one part in 10 to the 60th power, you can't have life. And think about it for a moment. If gravity is stronger, right, we all get squished into the earth, right? Uh, and and lots, lots of things would change. If it was just a little bit weaker, then... Um, you have other major problems in the universe. And they've, they've calculated this fine little narrow band where life is possible, and it's one part in 10 to the 60th. And they, ha they do the same thing for the cosmological constant, which measures how fast the universe is expanding. They say that's finely tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th. <laughs> so here's, here's the reasoning. Premise one, our, fin our universe is finely tuned for the existence of complex life. Premise two, this fine-tuning is not the result of physical laws. Conclusion, therefore, a supernatural fine-tuner exists. Now, there is another possibility other than God's existence to explain the fine-tuning of the universe. It could have just happened by chance. Roger Penrose 
said that the odds of the universe having the right proportion of mass and energy is one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd power. Now, this is a number that I've been wrestling with and uh, generating an Excel spreadsheet to just sort of like figure out, okay, because it's somewhat unusual to have an exponent to another exponent. Those of you who do math, I mean, it's not a normal move. This is what Penrose says. He's, uh, he's at Oxford. He says, even if we were to write a zero, you know, like if you write out a number, you put a one and you put all these zeros, okay? If you want to put a zero on each separate proton and on each separate neutron in the entire universe, and we could throw in all the other particles as well, for good measure, we should fall far short of writing down the figure needed. The, the chances of the universe popping into existence with the right proportions that we need of mass and energy, and these, as well as these other constants, right? The chances of it happening are so small that you literally, literally could not write the number down. You couldn't even write the number down. If you used all the protons and, and particles in all the world, you couldn't even write the number down at how unlikely it is. Let me just think about it like this. In New York State, the chances of being struck by lightning in a year is, according to 2011, one in about four million. Okay, so if you got struck by lightning this year, it'd be one in four million. And then if you got struck by lightning again next year, now it's one in 16 million. Okay, so let's say John gets struck by lightning. Sorry, John. Um, and this is, not, this is not assuming you work on like telephone poles or something. This is just a random chance of getting struck by lightning. Uh, so he gets struck by lightning once. We're like, oh, John, you know, that's, that's just awful. You know, I'm so glad you survived. You know, we move on with life. The next year, boom, it happens again. Struck by lightning a second time. <laughs> like, John, what, what are you doing? It, it would be, become some, I mean, assuming he was okay, it becomes somewhat of a joke, like this guy gets struck by lightning. What do we do it three times? Three years in a row, John gets struck by lightning. What do we do it four times? We start to say something like, we think you're doing it wrong. You know, like, whatever you're doing, you're doing, you, you know, we would investigate your umbrella, we would look into the static electricity in your house. I, I don't know, we would do all kinds of research, right? What if it kept going? Every year you get struck by lightning, every year. It happens over and over and over again, like clockwork, one in four million every year. It keeps happening, it keeps happening. At what point do we ask the question, there's a conspiracy going on here. There's, there's some sort of design behind the fact that you keep getting struck by lightning. It's not by chance, the chances are just too small. And yet the chances of you getting struck by lightning every year for the rest of your life are far better than that the universe would have come into existence accidentally. Or think about the New York State Lotto. The lottery f uh, for last week was 1 in 22,528,737, assuming you played once on one ticket. So that's a little worse than getting struck by lightning twice two years in a row, right? Once one year and then again the next year. Did you hear me? Play winning the lottery is less likely than getting struck by lightning two years in a row. And yet everyone's doing it, right? Um, what if you knew someone that won the lottery, they bought one ticket, they played one set of numbers, and they won the lottery, and then the next year they did it again, and they won the lottery, and then the third year they did it again, and they did that for 20 years. <laughs> what do you think about that person? Nobody would say they're just getting lucky. You know, at a certain point of chances, and, and we, we say, look, no, there's, something's rigged. Or to use one, one last example, imagine a firing squad. Firing squad. This is William Lane Craig again. They, he says, they line you up. They're all expert marksmen. You've got 100 of them. You're standing there, blindfolded, and you hear the deafening roar. They shoot. The dust settles. And wouldn't you know it, they've all missed. Every single one of them, 100 people in the firing squad, they've all missed. Who in the world would say, I am just the luckiest person alive. You wouldn't say, well, of course they all missed. I'm here, and if they hadn't missed, I wouldn't be here to know it. You wouldn't say that. You know what you would say? Someone somewhere paid these guys off. Someone somewhere threatened these guys. Somebody did something 
to fix it so that they would all miss. Because the chance of even one marksman missing is incredibly small. A hundred? Come on. Fred Hoyle, the astrophysicist, said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics, as well as with chemistry and biology, and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. The probability of life originating at random is so utterly minuscule as to make the random concept absurd. All right, moving on to our next reason for God's existence, the DNA code. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one or the, the next one, but it goes like this. All languages come from a mind, not natural processes. That's number one. Number two, DNA is a language. I think you pr pretty much people know that. <laughs> DNA is a language. It has certain letters in it that make up the, the, the four strands on the, the, the ladder of the d double helix. And it, there's a syntax to it. It's not like they're just random letters and, and they could be in any order. No, th there's, a, there's a particular order they need to be in for certain things to happen. And it's an encoding, decoding system, which is why we often call, call it the DNA code, just like we would call uh, computer programming languages code or Morse code. And um, you know, Morse code is, is much simpler than DNA. And Morse code came from what? A mind. Somebody, probably a guy named Morse, came up with that code. Um, so the question that we, we ask is, OK, so if all languages come from a mind and DNA is a language, all biological life requires DNA to exist. Even the smallest little bacterium, the most basic of all life on Earth, is, it runs on DNA. And it's not a simple version. I mean, it's, it's simpler than our DNA, but it's, it's not like, oh, there's just like two letters or something. You know, it's, it's still the DNA that we know of. Therefore, conclusion, a non-biological DNA designer exists. If all language comes from a mind and DNA is a language, then DNA comes from a mind. That mind cannot be itself a DNA-driven mind. In other words, it can't be a human being or some sort of animal. It's got to be something other than a carbon-based life form in order to have invented DNA. All right, number four, moral absolutes. So getting away from the science into the realm of ethics. Moral absolutes exist. That's premise one here. I give the example, torturing children for the fun of it is always wrong. Anybody want to disagree? OK. So we all agree then that <laughs> that's, that's a classic uh, trap right there. Uh, sort of like asking the question, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Uh, there's no good answer to that. But uh, yeah, so torturing little children for the fun of it is always wrong. We can all agree that that is a moral absolute. It's, it's, it's always wrong to do that. Um, and so. The question is, well, where do we get absolute? Where do we get this moral from? And you have a few options. You have nature, society, or individuals. But the problem is none of them can supply moral absolutes. If you get your morality from nature, think about nature. Let's, let's just assume atheism for a second, assume naturalism, the idea that the universe sort of just popped into existence with all these perfect conditions for life, and then life uh, came, sprung up and, and, and came into life and uh, nat just naturally developed. What did we learn from that? What morality would we, would we derive from uh, natural evolution, right? It would be something like this. If you're stronger, you should have more. It would be something like this. If you're weaker, you should die, right? That's the morality you would get from, you know, we call it the survival of the fittest. This, this is a very immoral system, if you think about it at any length. Uh, killing off everyone that's handicapped is a natural conclusion based on Darwinism. And yet, what society would say, oh, well, that sounds good. Let's just do that. Well, there was one. There was one. They were called Nazis. They were, they were living consistently with their social Darwinist principles. And what, what did we get from the Nazis? Let's think about it. Concentration camps. <laughs> That's the most immoral thing in all of, of, you know, probably of all of human history, right? 
So the, 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 the nature itself is not a good source for morality. Just look at how animals treat each other, and you know that that's not a good source for morality. Then you have societies. The problem with societies is you have one society in, in one country that says, okay, this is what we consider to be wrong. Uh, we think that adultery is, is wrong and that you should be killed if, you, if you're caught and, and if you're convicted of the, the crime of adultery. That's what that one country believes. Okay? There are countries in our world today that believe this. And then you have another country that says, you know what, uh, I believe, we, we, we think that adultery is wrong, but it's not a crime. You know, it's not a crime. We're not going to punish you for committing adultery. Uh, if you commit adultery, that's your problem, but the government has nothing to do with it. Uh, live your own life. Okay? Who's to say which one of those societies is right? You know, if there's no God, who's to say which one of those societies is right? It's all relative. It's like, okay, well, this is socially constructed. That's socially constructed. Our society, you know, thinks it, it's this way, and that society thinks it's that way. They're, everything's relative. Nothing's absolute. It's just like, well, uh, preference. Or individuals, too. I can make decisions for my own morality, but that doesn't have any effect on you. If I invent my own morality, how, how does that place a duty on you to live the way I say? Individual constructed morality doesn't work either. So you need an external source to society, nature, and individual people to supply morality. And so you need some sort of moral basis behind it all, a supernatural source for morality. And then number five is miracles. It goes something like this. Miracles are events in which the laws of nature are interrupted by an agent outside of the natural realm. Two, documented miracles have happened. Conclusion, therefore, a miracle causer exists. Now, on naturalism, assuming atheism for a second, on naturalism, coincidences are, are not miracles. And anything that happens that seems like it's a miracle has to either just be a coincidence, just a, a random uh, coincidence, or some sort of phenomenon that we just don't yet understand. One of those two. G.K. Chesterton said, but my belief that miracles have happened in human history is not a mystical belief at all. I believe in them upon human evidences as I do in the discovery of America. Upon this point, there is a simple logical fact that only requires to be stated and cleared up. Somehow or other, an extraordinary idea has arisen that the disbelievers in miracles consider them coldly and fairly, while believers in miracles accept them only in connection with some dogma. So what Chesterton is saying here is that religious people, you know, we, we just, we just uh, accept miracles, and, and, you know, thinking rational people, they don't accept miracles. He's like, whoa, 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 hold on a second. He continues, the fact is quite the other way. The believers in miracles accept them, rightly or wrongly, because they have evidence for them. The disbelievers in miracles deny them, rightly or wrongly, because they have a doctrine against them. The open, obvious, democratic thing is to believe an old apple woman when she bears testimony to a miracle, just as you believe an old apple woman when she bears testimony to a murder. If it comes to human testimony, there is a choking cataract of human testimony in favor of the supernatural. If you reject it, you can only mean one of two things. You reject the peasant story about the ghost either because the man is a peasant or because the story is a ghost story. That is, you either deny the main principle of democracy or you affirm the main principle of materialism, the abstract impossibility of miracle. You have a perfect right to do so, but in that case, you are the dogmatist. It is we Christians who accept all actual evidence. It is you rationalists who refuse actual evidence, being constrained to do so by your creed. But I am not constrained by any creed in the matter, and looking impartially into certain miracles of medieval and modern times, I have come to the conclusion that they occurred. What Chesterton is saying here is that because Christians accept the possibility of miracles, we can be critical when we hear a story about a miracle. And we can weigh it out based on the evidence. Is this person trustworthy? Was there anyone else there that saw this happen? Is there any scientific evidence that can support this, like an x-ray before and after, right? As Christians, we can actually investigate miracles and accept and reject ones that hold up or, or don't. 
Whereas if you are an atheist, you have to reject all miracles from the start on the presupposition that miracles are impossible. Who is being dogmatic here? And who's open-minded? That's just a word about miracles. Now, as far as the United States goes, according to a 2016 Gallup poll, 89% believe in God. In 2016, Barna found that 66% of American adults believe that God can supernaturally heal people. And 68% have prayed for God to heal someone. And 27% of Americans have experienced a physical healing that could only be explained as a miracle. 65 million people in the United States. It's just one country. And it's a fairly secular-leaning country in some, in some ways and in some areas. And yet, I mean, look, if only one of those people actually had a miracle, that would be enough to prove God exists. All we need is one in all of human history. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just too stacked against the other side, I think. All right, let's... Uh, uh, I want to mention this book here. This is uh, Miracles by Eric Metaxas. Uh, he does a great job, especially in the uh, beginning part, explaining this. That's where I got the Chesterton quote from. And he, he documents a whole bunch of miracles that he uh, has firsthand evidence for, for that, uh, <clears throat> or I guess secondhand evidence for, where people he knows and he, he trusts. Uh, and the other book there is by Craig Keener on miracles, the credibility of the New Testament accounts, if you're interested in the subject. All right, on to the last reason for God's existence, God experiences. This is my favorite proof of all. Premise, I've experienced God. Conclusion, therefore God exists. That's pretty fast. That's pretty fast. I mean, it was <laughs> not much, to, not much uh, to, to uh, think about there. How do you know the wind exists? You feel wind. Right? So you know that there's such a thing as wind if you feel wind. It's a direct experience argument. You don't have to go through a whole series of logical steps. Um, how do you know when you're in love? You feel it. You just, you know when you're in love. You, you, you don't need to say, well, let's see. Um, have I had any thoughts about this, this other person today? And were they positive? It's not that sort of thing. You just, you just know it or you don't, right? And so, so it is with God experiences. God is personal. According to Matthew chapter 10, you don't need to turn there. I've just got it on the screen here. It says, Jesus says in verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Two sparrows are sold for a penny. What is he saying there? Par sparrows are cheap. Okay, that's what he's saying. They're inexpensive. You can buy two for a penny. And not one of them, even though their lives are so minuscule and, and, and under, you know, and they're just, they're just not worth a lot. And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. What is that saying about this God that created everything? It's just a really interesting way of, of going about it. Like Jesus is like, oh, you're worth way more than sparrows. And not one of them hits the ground and your father doesn't know. He knows your hairs on your head. So this is saying that God is personal. And so if this claim about God is true, then we should have accounts from people who have experienced God. Now, of course, the, the, the biggest account of all is the resurrection. And that also falls under the classification of a miracle. And we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus in a, a, a subsequent time together. But I found something really great for this. Really great. Really awesome. Are you ready? This is Blaise Pascal, a Frenchman who was a mathematician, a physicist, inventor, a writer, and a theologian. Total package. Uh, child prodigy, invented uh, by some accounts the first computer. Uh, it was a mechanical calculator. It could uh, add, subtract, multiply, and divide six digit numbers. You know, it's like a mechanic, no screen, you know, mechanical thing. It would like wheels and levers and stuff. Awesome. That's Blaise Pascal. He died, sadly, at 39. He didn't make it very far in life. 1654. Um, or not, not 1654. Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that. Let's see. It would be, it would be eight years after that. So 1664. Uh, 1662. Thank you. <laughs> That's when he died. So seven, he lived in the 17th century there. Uh, so he died at the age of 39 
And nine years after his, he died, a servant, a household servant, found uh, his jacket that he liked to wear, his, his sort of indoor jacket. And uh, it, 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 it had a, a, some sort of padding sewn into it. And the servant got closer and, and noticed that it was something sewn into the coat. And it was parchment. And he, and he removed the parchment from the coat. And inside was a faded sheet of paper, actually two sheets of paper. Uh, one was a copy of the other. One was very messy. This is a picture of the one that's very messy. I can zoom in and show you. Um, and then the second one is just a, a neat copy of the first one that he did. This piece of paper he kept over his heart until the day he died and never told anybody about it. They found it accidentally nine years after he died. And this, this paper comes back, comes to a time when he was 31, when he had this amazing God experience. Um, and it's, a, and it's, it's an experience that forever changed him. So this is, this is a translation of that paper, okay? This is, this is what he writes. The year of grace, 1654. Monday, 23 November, feast of St. Clement, Pope and martyr and others in the martyrology, the eve of St. Chrysogonus, martyr and others, from about half past 10 in the evening until about half past midnight. That's, that's his dating of it. And then it begins, fire. And he, when he writes the word fire, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's just sort of a word by itself. I, I can't really zoom in on it here for you, but it's just a word by itself. There's no, no words on the left or on the right of it. It's a new line all by itself, the word fire. And then he says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, not of the philosophers and intellectuals. Every one of these is on a new line, scrolled out in 17th century French, and random bits are in Latin because he was a you know, scholar. Not, not of the philosophers and the intellectuals. Certitude, certitude, feeling, joy, peace. The God of Jesus Christ, my God and your God. Your God will be my God. Forgetfulness of the world and of everything except God. One finds oneself only by way of the directions taught in the gospel. The grandeur of the human soul. O oh, just Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. Joy, 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 tears of joy. I have separated myself from him. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. My God, will you leave me? May I not be separated from him eternally. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God, and J.C., whom you have sent, Jesus Christ. And then in a little bigger letters the next time, Jesus Christ. I have separated myself from him, renounced him, crucified him. May I never be separated from him. One preserves oneself only by way of the lessons taught in the gospel. Renunciation, total and sweet, and so forth. And never told anybody about it. Died. They found it later. He wrote it down because he never wanted to forget that experience he had with God. And it changed him. After this, he focused on God. He focused on theology. He focused on writing about the Bible. Um, in fact, one of the things he writes is on the, the subject of the hiddenness of God. Sometimes atheists will say, well, how can you believe in God? There's not enough proof, or it's too hard to see that God exists. And uh, so typically Christians will say, well, God doesn't want to give so much evidence that it's coercive, but he wants to give sufficient evidence that for those who have eyes to see, they can see. Blaise Pascal wrote in his Pensee, number 274, wishing to appear openly to those who seek him wholeheartedly and to remain hidden from those who single-mindedly avoid him, God qualified the way he might be known so that he gave visible signs to those who seek him and none to those who do not. There is enough light for those whose only desire is to see and enough darkness for those of the opposite disposition. So that's, we call that the hiddenness of God, that God is not out uh, blaring his existence on every billboard, but that he is evident enough in creation and in other ways as well, like this experience that Pascal had, that he is, he is uh, able to be perceived. All right, so just let me summarize this and then I'll be done here. Each, each of these different reasons gives you some little snippet about God. Okay, so from the beginning of the universe, we conclude that, that God is eternal, immaterial, timeless, powerful, and a creator. From the fine-tuning for life, we learn that God is unimaginably, he is the unimaginably intelligent engineer 
of finely tuned life permitting conditions. From the DNA code, we learn that God is the original mind behind the encoding decoding language of DNA that underlies all biological life. From absolute morals, we learn that God is the absolute source of goodness, justice, and morality against which we can judge good from bad. It's because of God's character being so good and moral that we can even have a clue what's, what's good and what's bad. From miracles, we learn that God is the active miracle worker who intervenes in our world. And from God experiences, we learn that the personal being, that God is the personal being who pursues and redeems. And then we look at the scripture and we see all of these attributes of God, that he's merciful, that he's gracious, that he's slow to anger, that he's abounding in steadfast love, abounding in faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet will by no le means leave the guilty unpunished. Assuming Christianity is true, that this, you know, the Bible is true, and that the statement, I mean, would you, would you look at this God? He's awesome. We would, assuming Christianity is true and this God made us, okay, we wouldn't be surprised if the God who actually exists is the God who most satisfies our souls, since he's the one that made us in the first place. All right, that's it for this one. Let's take a break and we'll come back and learn a little bit more.